and, and he told us, don't go somewhere because you love the people. Go because God does. So when I was there with the Kimio people and did not feel that love, I said, Lord, I don't love them, but you do. And you have brought me here to give them your word. And that just changed my heart. All right, so we have gotten to the point where the Lord has blessed you and um, you have the support that you need, financial support, prayer support. Mm -hmm. What happens next? So then was, you know, getting the uh, passport and visa and all of that and uh, packing a crate because the field had uh, the field. You know, the missionaries in, in uh, Irian Jaya had sent me a list of things I needed to bring with me that are not available out there. Very practical things yes. that you need if you're, especially if you're, a, if you cannot live around a fire in a hut, right. you know. And uh, so gathering all that and then getting it crated, um, so dad had uh, had it up the crating crew. We borrowed someone's basement because our house didn't have a basement. And uh, so men of the church built the crate and packed the stuff in there as I got it. And that was all crated up. And the mission did not want me flying um, on my own. Uh, all the way from Spokane to uh, <laughs> just above Australia. Yes. <laughs> That's kind of a long ways, it's, especially in those days. It took a long time. And uh, so um, there was another couple, the Donaldson couple, Dr. Donaldson and his wife and their five kids. And so they decided that we should go together. I would travel with them. But we would meet, they also are from Washington State, mm -hmm. uh, but we would meet in, um, in Los Angeles and then get on the overseas flights together. And uh, the idea, I thought, was that they were to make sure that everything went well oh. with me and etc. And I would join the crew. Well, as I said, they had five kids, the youngest of whom was Philip, who had his, not only his blankie, but his broomstick horsey <laughs> that went through all of the airports with him. And the girls had their Barbie doll suitcases and they had all kinds of stuff. And uh, um, as we traveled, the um, airline crews, I could tell that they thought I was the nanny of the family. <laughs> <laughs> because I would sit with some of the girls and you know keep track of them. But anyway, it was a very, very interesting trip. And in those days, you had overnights in hotels right. along the way. And well, let me let me back up just a yeah. minute because there's Emma. a part I really want to ask you about. Uh, uh, I have oh, daughters and yeah. I wanted to know what were some of the conversations with your father, your mother? Oh. I mean, yeah. I just I, I just think about your dad putting that crate together. Yeah. So well, yeah, that's that's good to bring it back to there. Um, they never once said, they never once indicated that they were really concerned, even a little bit frightened, whether I could handle things. 
not once. I found out years later that they were. <laughs> but they just put me in the Lord's hands. And um, when they took me to the airport in Spokane to leave, leave. Um, that was in the days when security was not like it was now. Right. So they accompanied me right to the gate, and um, I I could see as I sat in in my seat on the plane, I could see out the window, and I could see Dad through the window, standing there at the gate, you know, look watching the plane, and I knew it was him because he had this bright green shirt on that was his favorite shirt. And in my mind, I said, I may not ever see him again. Why would I think something like that? I don't know. But uh, indeed, I never did see him again. He passed away during my second year on the, on the field. And I've always been so grateful to the Lord for giving me that impossible last glimpse of my daddy. Well, and, and I understand if you're a little hesitant, to, but what were some of the last conversations? Did he, did he tell, you know, like his daughter, I mean, he, he loved the Lord. Yes, he did. And he has this daughter. Yeah. I mean, you know, I can't think of a greater honor. I don't remember. I'm, I'm sure he said, we'll be praying for you, honey. Dad was not a man of many words. I'm sure he was so but, proud of what God had done in your life, though. Oh, yes, I know that now. Well, I did then, too. You know, I knew that he was behind me 100%. Boy, I bet he was uh, interceding. Oh, absolutely he was. Yeah. And he had a heart for the world. One of my memories of him is seeing him there at the kitchen table once a month with his checkbook, writing out checks for missionaries. So God couldn't now, have given him a greater gift. You know, and that spoke volumes to a child when you see your parents putting priority there. They didn't have to say, oh, you know, we're really behind missions and everybody ought to be behind missions. No, they didn't have to say that. They lived it. They lived it. Yeah. They gave, every time a missionary came home on furlough, they would kill one of our steers and give that missionary half the meat to tide them over for their furlough, you know? Yeah, I've seen this over and over and over again. Uh, parents, or maybe it might even be grandparents mm -hmm. that prayed for missions, that loved missions, that maybe never went to the mission field. Mm -hmm. And it's like God, I, I can't think of anything greater than yeah. one of your children, or grandchildren going off for Christ. Yeah. Um, that that is that's why I wanted to know. I mean, there's this this legacy. And then um, after he died, he he uh, had cancer, and it went really really quickly. And um, but when he got the diagnosis of cancer, he wrote me a letter. And in those days, that was the only means of communication, right. was letters that took two or three weeks to cross the ocean. And um, so he, he told me about that. And he told me, he said, I'm at peace. I know that God has me in his hands, and he has you in his hands. And just the blessing that I received from him in that letter. I still have it. I have really? it in a special. Yeah, I do. I brought it back, and uh, I have it. 
Yeah. And uh, well, one day yes. you see him. I, I suppose he'd be waiting at the door. Oh, <laughs> I know both he and mom. Yeah, yeah. And uh, um, I received the telegram because telegrams were faster in those right. days. Right. Although t they were not fast because they had to first go to Jakarta, and then across Indonesia to Irian Jaya to a telephone slash telegraph office um, that would receive it and then they had to call the RBMU office and tell them come down for a telegraph. <laughs> and um, so when the telegraph finally made that journey, you know, it said that dad was gone hmm. yeah so and, but I got it on the day of his funeral on the very day on the very day of his funeral yeah so that's how long it took even a telegraph to reach me so mom yeah I was so concerned with what about mom because they were a unit dad was the outdoor guy. He took care of the farm and the animals and stuff, except the chickens. The chickens were moms. How did, and, how did she feel about you going to the mission field? Oh, she was like dad. They were both secretly um, had their secret doubts that I could handle it physically, but they weren't going to say that. They knew that I was in God's hands. And, you know, they were, they're very, very supportive. So after dad died, I um, wrote to mom and I said, uh, mom, I'd like to come home, you know, and just spend a little bit of time with you. Because she didn't drive. <laughs> and, I was really concerned for her, and she and Dad, they really, really, really loved each other and uh, relied on each other, and I just didn't know how she could make it on her own, and uh, her answer was, no, I've got to get used to this by myself because this is the way it's going to be, so I've got to adjust. So. So you come from a long line of matter-of-fact people. This is what I must do. And well, they were married during the Depression. Yeah. yeah that pretty much sums it up, doesn't that does. it? That does. Yeah. So, um, so what, what was it like when you, uh, <clears throat> you got off the plane? So you're, you're there. Um, yeah. Smells, Every sights, sounds. Oh everything. yeah, <laughs> everything. Yeah, and and the people. I mean, it was. I, I was not. I did not know a whole lot about it because uh, you didn't have internet in those days. Right. So there was no way to prepare you for what you were going to see and smell and hear and all of that. And uh, so it was. It was fascinating. You know, I, I really found it fascinating. Yeah, and the sounds, this babble that I had not a clue what anything meant. So you hadn't studied anything of the oh, language, no. just linguistics? Uh, no, there was no way to study Indonesian beforehand in those days. Now you could get on the internet and learn some if you wanted, but nah, nothing. You know, while, while I was in Peru, something happened. Um, it was the internet. Another uh, great problem that I saw was people who were in the jungle who had really no ac access to the great corruption and vanity that's, yeah. you know, in, in what we would consider the modern world. All of a sudden, they're flooded by it. Yeah. And it, it opened up a kind of a Pandora's box. Yes. 
it it uh it it made it much more much yeah. more difficult. Yeah. So you you just you get off the plane. What happens? Okay, then uh, this was right before Christmas, so nobody in the interior was ready to receive us yet. And what the plan was was that we would go to uh, Carubaga, which was uh, in the uh, was the main area at that time for the uh, Dani tribe, and we had a conference ground there. When, when I say conference ground, in a very primitive sense. I know what you mean. Um, where uh, we would be taught the Indonesian language. There was a course in Indonesian for new RBMU missionaries, but others as well. So it's Indonesian and then the Yeah, then tribal. the tribal language, yeah. So in the meantime, um, while I think it was a two weeks before the school was going to open, and it was right before Christmas, so the girls in the uh, uh, TMF, the Missions Fellowship office, we called them the town girls, the <laughs> ones who, who worked in that office and did all kinds of things for the interior missionaries, which allowed the interior missionaries to be there. You know, that's a, that's a point that... Um... Recently, it's become more and more important for me. The gift of administration in missions. Yeah. And sometimes it's looked down on like you're not no. the missionary. Not. And if you look in the New Testament, it is a spiritual gift. Yes. And without administration, missions could it, not be. No, could not be. J just like in, in mm -hmm. World War II, it was the administration, especially in England, of yeah. getting the factories going and getting the yeah. food planted for the soldiers. And yeah. The older I get, the more and more I appreciate and honor the administrator yes. in, in world missions. Yes, absolutely. So they invited me to stay with them over Christmas, So, um, which was good. That was a gradual introduction to Indonesian culture. They took me to church, and, and uh, so I... I heard, you know, this language I did not know, but um, when they sang from their Indonesian hymn book, I could follow, and I, I realized that, oh, it's actually written the way it sounds, <laughs> which is different from our language. <laughs> yeah. My, my wife, her, her first language is not English, and she goes, why, your, your language, what's wrong with it? it? It's not written as it sounds, you know. <laughs> yeah. Did you have um, your poles, as you call them, your crutches? My crutches, yes. What was the response from people when they would see you, the, especially the Indonesians? Indonesians, yeah. Often it was, oh, you know, it was respect in a different way. Mm -hmm. They respected that this foreigner was there with them who was crippled, you know, and they they respected that I had come yeah. under those circumstances. And they knew you were there for them. I think so, yeah. Um, definitely when I got to Corpoon, they did. They knew that. When did you make your first trip into the... Interior. It was, uh, oh, okay, after Christmas, my first trip interior was to Carobaga to the uh, uh, language learning. But during those three months, I made a visit to um, various places, including Corpoon. I did not yet know where I would be, uh, and I was to listen to missionaries talk about where the needs were and and discern where the Lord mm -hmm. needed me. So I visited Korapun and uh, yeah, it was really cool. And I I just- Really cool? Yeah, was it, it was. Was it a little bit of a shock? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I was 
kind of halfway prepared because at that people, the Dani tribe, the Dani people were st still very much um, living in their villages as they had. They had um, responded to the gospel, um, but they were still, you know, wearing what they traditionally wore or didn't right. wear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we had gone on picnics through the mountains, so they had carried me on the trail. So I was, uh, I was kind of gradually prepared for that. But did, did you ever, did it ever enter into your mind like, what have I done? Like, whoa, this is bigger no. than I thought. Uh -uh. Wonderful. Mm -mm. I knew I was supposed to be there. And it was just exciting to learn all this stuff. Yeah. Um, exciting until after I, after I finally was at Korpun in my own house. And uh, I was starting to learn Kimyo and to learn Kimyo ways. What was your first house like? Oh, it was a, it was, uh, they had had a, uh, they brought in a portable sawmill and took it high up to where they're, to the trees, the forest, jungle forest, the high, uh, high altitude jungle forest and cut some boards. And so it was just single board floors with gaps, little gaps in between. And some of the walls had boards, um, and the structure was made out of milled timber that they had milled that way. But um, and the roof, me, uh, aluminum, tin. yeah, tin, yeah. What well, what was um, just so? What were some of the the first obstacles like? Most people, when they go in the jungle, one of the biggies is the just the heat, the insects. What what was it like for you? It was it, well. There's no heat up there. It was that it was almost six thousand feet elevation. Okay. So, despite the fact that we were just six degrees south of the equator, right. it was not hot. Um, so, yeah, that that was it was mostly. Uh, most days, either sweater or even jacket weather. Really? Except in the afternoons when it didn't rain, which were very few. And when the sun shone in the afternoon, it could sting you, even though the air wasn't hot, uh, because you're, the atmosphere was so thin up there. Then did you sleep with a mosquito net and things no, like that? Just we out didn't have mosquitoes really? at that altitude. The... The biggest thing that was was not the 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 insects or the weather or anything. I did not like their personality. They were um, loud. They were pushy. They were boisterous. They, um, all these, they were explosive. You never knew how close you were to the end of the fuse with them. And uh, one day I said to the Lord, I do not love these people, but I know you love them. So I am going to stay and I am going to do hear what you want me to do. Give them the word. And you know, I decided, I learned after a while to see the other side of things. It wasn't that they were just pushy and aggressive and all that. They were focused. And they were determined, and they had a goal, and they were going to reach it. And they were upfront. They didn't try to to 
trick you like the personality so you started of started seeing guys. the positive yeah i saw them. the positive side yeah. of them i think that's a, probably not as radical but that's something that every missionary when you when mm -hmm. you go into a place even though it's maybe quite similar to your culture mm -hmm. you're going to find things that because they're different you're going to <clears throat> oppose it and it's going to make you angry and things but if you can make that switch yeah to focus on wow the, the, the mm. positive aspects of things, then it transforms the way you look at even the negative. Yeah. yeah. I remembered a lecture from my missions professor at Prairie, who was my favorite professor. And he had been a missionary in China and had had to march out when the communists, he and his family, and had even had to bury a baby beside the trail as they... Oh my. left the country and um, he related a story of having to go down a river on a sampan with a million other Chinese people who he did not like he did not like the Chinese people but it was an overnight trip and uh, so everybody laid down on the sampan and they were like sardines literally were sleeping side by side, head to foot. And a Chinese man shared his blanket with him. Mm -hmm. And that changed his heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he and he told us, don't go somewhere because you love the people. Go because God does. And that stuck in my head. So when I was there with the Kimio people and did not feel that love at first, um, I said, Lord, I don't love them, but you do. And you have brought me here to give them your word. And that just changed my heart, just like it did Mr. Douglas's heart, you know, when he made that change in China. And, and God will, God will not only bring a love, but also be able to appreciate yeah. the things. I, I, I know yeah. a friend of mine was working in the Middle East in a refugee camp, and he said people were pulling at him and demanding and lying and stealing. All, you know, a lot of things, that, desperate things people do in desperate times. And he said, I was so full of anger. And then he said, all of a sudden, I looked, and there was a young boy. And he said... You know, in the Middle East, some people are more fair-skinned or whatever. And he goes, for a second, he goes, I looked and it was, I, I thought, what is my son doing here? How mm -hmm. did my son get in the middle of all these men and what, why, why is he dressed? And he goes, all of a sudden, he goes, I looked and I, I saw them as my family. I saw them mm -hmm. as my son. My, my, you know, my father, my mother, my sister, my brother. And he goes, everything changed. Yeah. And uh, because God does love people. He does. And, uh, and if we'll just lay aside a lot of maybe even prejudices and, yeah. and arrogance, yeah. we'll not only accept people, but we'll also come to appreciate things. Like I came to appreciate things that I realized, oh, I wish I had that in my culture yeah. too. Exactly. At the same time. Yeah, yeah. So as I lived among them, I more and more and more um, grew to genuinely love those people and uh, appreciate these unique things about their culture that was different even from the tribes around them. Right. You know, each one of the tribes has its own distinct personality. And they just happen to have a very um, <laughs> aggressive personality. <laughs> but it's good. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just dearly love them. Dearly love them.